welcome to my new shop series. I am doing auto tech from my shop. Not really a shop so much as it is really a garage that I'm cleaning out and trying to get kind of in a position to uh, be doing more of this. Um, but I am trying. You can see I've got my whiteboard. I've got a bench top. I've got tools. I've got everything I need to do this. Just simply uh, getting things a little bit more organized. So over the course of these next few videos that I'll be sending, um, it'll probably get cleaned up a little bit more and look a little bit better. I'll also show you guys around and show you some of the projects that I have, um, stuff I'm working on, stuff related to auto tech or electric motors or you know small engine type stuff. All of it hopefully interesting and hopefully beneficial for you. So um, I do want to make sure that you all understand auto tech hoodies are in. So it's time. I am going to be setting up a date where we can come and pick these up, hopefully next week at some point in time. Um, I do want to get in touch with everybody and talk to them and figure out what is the most central point and where people can come to pick these up, um, where the easiest place for them to come pick them up is. So just understand they are available. They turned out really good. I'm really pumped with how the back turned out. You can see that uh, the quality of the print turned out really well. You can see a lot of detail. And um, yeah, they're all in boxes ready to go. I just got to get uh, got to get them in your hands. So with that, I do want to introduce our next segment, electric motors. So what we're going to try and do is continue on the path that we started at FLTCC um, and continue moving through the curriculum that we have. I have access to all of it. I can put it on Google Classroom for you. I just wanted to make sure that we all understood how to get on um, our Google Classroom from home. Um, that's really what the last two weeks were, was a little bit of review, making sure that we all could kind of feel out the system, make sure that we're all aware of some of the, I guess, potential hiccups that we could run into. Um, but essentially, this is what we're going to be doing. This is our distance learning. It's me talking to a GoPro, talking to you. And uh, I want to make sure that we all benefit from this. So myself, I know um, not having all my resources has proven to be a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of an anxiety maker in my life. Um, I like to have all of my resources and all of my examples and things like that. So I might have to tear some stuff apart and then that way you guys can see what I'm talking about. Um, I might have to show you guys um, how something works on a project that relates to automotive but maybe isn't necessarily automotive. Something like a four-stroke engine off of a lawnmower or something like that. Um, I do have cars. I do have opportunity to teach you guys some things. And um, when we talk about things like starter circuits, which is really the section that we're going into, um, understand I can show you guys around my cars and how they work. So um, I know it's going to be different than what we anticipated, but this is where we are and I'm going to do my best to teach you guys to the best of my ability. So the reason that we're really talking about electric motors in the first place is to really understand that our electrical circuit, our electrical systems that we were starting to talk about um, before we were interrupted, um, really boiled down to the fact that we have a starter, a big old electric motor in your vehicle that is designed simply to start up your internal combustion engine. Now, nowadays, modern systems and electric cars and things like that, they take that and they up the ante a tenfold. Because now all of a sudden it's not just a DC electric motor that needs two wires to operate. Now all of a sudden it becomes a three-phase AC electric motor. And we'll talk about what that really means um, when we talk about alternators because it's kind of the inverse of it. Um, but what I want you to understand is this little DC electric motor is very similar to the motor that you might find in your starter. The starter adds a couple of more parts and pieces such as a, a pinion gear, a throw out mechanism so that it can engage and disengage. And then um, it uses a starter solenoid usually attached to it that engages and disengages the high current needed to turn over that large um, internal combustion engine. But we're going to talk on a little bit more of a finer scale with our DC electric motors. Now these DC electric motors I have, they're off of some old uh, Razor scooters that I found kind of kicked off to the side of the road and I said, hey, you know what? Those electric motors probably still work. They probably have bad batteries. And sure enough, bad batteries. Now this one has been sitting for a little while and I don't know if you can hear it. Um, something's come loose inside. So this one's more than likely trash. So we're going to tear it apart and we're going to see what's going on inside. So when we talk about electric motors, there's really not a lot of moving parts and pieces. 
um, not like an internal combustion gasoline engine. The internal combustion gasoline engine has to have pistons and connecting rods, crankshafts, it has to have a cooling system, it has to have an ignition system, it has to have many, many, many parts and pieces to support the overall process of running on gasoline. Um, electric motors, not so complex. They may look complex when you tear them apart, and we'll see what it looks like later, but um, the reality is when we talk about an electric motor, there's not a lot of unique parts from motor to motor to motor. Um, we have some basic things like uh, these small electric motors, they typically have some permanent magnets inside. And those permanent magnets create a magnetic field inside this so that when we actually pass current through the conductors inside, they fight those magnetic fields and it generates motion. It's kind of the same idea as if you took two magnets and put them nearby one another. You put them pole to pole, north to south, they're going to attract and they're going to just sit there and pull together. But if you put common poles together, you will have a very difficult time pushing them together because what you're fighting are invisible lines of flux. Now magnets are kind of unique that they create these invisible lines, but it's the same idea as how compass works, how a compass works. Um, our planet generates a magnetic field and we have invisible lines of flux flowing around us all the time that emanate from the North Pole and go to the South Pole and they're big invisible lines but we can use a compass, which is basically calibrated to point north to follow those lines of flux. And uh, we can do the same thing with electric motors here. I'm gonna link to a couple of videos that can do it way better than I can. Um, but they show the operation of electric motors. They show the operation of a magnetic field where a compass suddenly swings its needle towards the magnet that's being energized. We're gonna talk about the bits and pieces inside of our system here though, right now. So we've got our electric motor. And a little bit rusty on here, and like I said, it kind of makes some bad noises inside. But it'd be interesting to see what's going on inside of here. Uh, in order to get this thing apart, we're going to have to get this sprocket off of here. And that sprocket looks like it's pretty well rusted on there. So I'm going to get a little bit of PB Blaster on here, let it soak for a sec, and then we're going to try and get this nut off of here. Might be a little bit more difficult than I'm anticipating, but we'll see. Almost feels like it's left hand threads. I want to break it. Yep, definitely is. Hurrah. Got a little space around here along with the sprocket. It is being difficult. It's a very tight fit. Kind of impressed. Alright, so we got it off. Now that we've gotten that off, it is in fact left hand threads, which makes sense. As the motor spins, if it were to come up against any sort of resistance and this were to uh, hold back, it would actually automatically loosen the nut. So by putting left hand threads on there, it makes sure that it always stays tight. So clever, clever move. So the case is just a cylinder and it has a pass through for the wires and it has two end caps. And the end caps are where the bearings are designed to uh, mount 
to support the shaft so it sits there and freely floats. Um, they're going to split apart, and there's probably uh, bolts that go from here all the way through side to side that hold this thing together. So we'll find out next. You can feel the magnetic field as you try to use the screwdriver on it. Things kind of take the screwdriver and move it around a little bit. You can see it kind of attaches there. All right, there we go. So now that that's apart, we'll be able to split our case. Probably pull the tail end off first. When we get in here, we can see that it's definitely had some water inside here. But what I want you to see from this angle is we have one permanent magnet here and we have another permanent magnet here. This is what's causing the attraction here. But ultimately what they're supposed to do is pass force or lines of flux across this section here and in this angle you can see all these copper windings each segment of copper windings creates an electromagnet so this pole shoe here and this pole shoe here basically are the north and south of one magnet and as it turns <coughs> now there's our noise those magnets aren't staying where they're supposed to as this turns within our electromagnets it's going to have different effects because those lines that are going across are now being interrupted by lines that this thing is generating off of itself all the way around to the opposite side's pole. And when we see that, what we understand is that when it is at its 90 degree mark or thereabout, let's say it's this shoe here, it's going to naturally, if it, depending on the polarity, be pushed by this line of flux here towards this one. And as it rotates, it's going to spin a set of contacts. Now, the contacts are up in this end. We may not be able to split this end as easily. This may actually pull out this way. Well, I'll fight with it for a minute here and get it apart. Seems like there's a little space or something here. It's the bearing. It's just the bearing being difficult. All right, there we go. So what you can see here is that this whole thing spins on bearings. This whole assembly is known as the armature. And the armature is divided up into individual segments. And like I said, if you look at it, this connection point here and this connection point here are essentially one magnet and then another magnet, and another magnet, and another magnet, going all the way around and evenly dividing this circle. Each winding set that wraps around each of these iron plates here creates the magnet. And each segment is connected to individual sections here, which electrically connect to your positive and negative leads. And you can see in here where we have this is going to be difficult here, but we have brushes. These brushes are spring-loaded and are designed to ride against this surface here known as the commutator. Basically, it's just a switch. Point A and point B here with my fingertips is one segment and another segment and another. And as it switches from one segment to another, it activates different electromagnets here. And those fight our permanent magnets electrical fields that are generated and cause this to just sit here inside and spin with a certain amount of force. So we have some basic parts. Number one, we have a shaft. Everything's mounted on this central shaft and we have bearings on the ends. Once you move past that, you have to understand that we are talking about an armature. And a lot of times we discuss armature windings as having failed. 
a lot of times um, starter motors you'll have a dead segment which means that probably the connection point here at the commutator has gotten bad or one of the wires is broken and it's no longer continuous just like the circuits that we talked about before these continuous loops need to be continuous otherwise they're not going to pass current when they're not passing current they're not generating an electromagnet field to oppose here and so you have a dead spot when it hits that dead spot it doesn't naturally want to move out of the way it kind of finds that point and settles there and that's why you might be able to start a car sometimes and um, when you go and park it and you go to get it next time it won't start because that dead segment of the armature has fallen at that point where um, you have no electromagnetic opposing forces So I'm trying to figure out what these blue things are here, and I think for lack of a better explanation, they're counterweights. I think they are kind of like balancing a tire. They've added these little blobs here and here to act as a balance. Pretty weird concept. A lot of times I've seen it on other motors where they'll, they'll cut a segment of this out and that'll counteract an imbalance on this side but um, I think that's what these are. I think they're counterweights. But anyway, our next segments of our motor beyond the armature and the windings and the bearings and shaft is our commutator. And the commutator, as I said before, is a rotary contact switch. And you can see it's broken into segments. It's all copper. It's all individual segments associated with different segments of the armature, but they're, they cannot be bridged, otherwise this segment and this segment come on at the same time. The brushes, which we saw inside here, and I'm going to try and remove one of them, ride against that commutator. <clears throat> there we go. Nothing a little brute force won't fix. You can see where it's been riding. You can see those individual grooves and they ride against here. So as this spins, the brushes slide across the surface. And the brushes are usually some sort of like carbon graphite material that is very slippery, but it conducts electricity. So there are times where it's transitioning from one segment to another, and you might have two on at the same time, two segments of the magnet on at the same time, but it's constantly switching from one to another to another this could be, let's say you're positive, you're gonna have another one on this side as your negative, and it's gonna energize both points. By energizing both points, you've activated a magnet. That magnet opposes the magnetic field inside the housing, and it causes it to move. It's trying to move out of the way, is what it's really doing. It's trying to move away from this one, which it's the same polarity, and towards this magnet, which is the opposite polarity. So it's naturally gonna go um, 180 degrees, and then rest there. But because that motion causes this to spin and the brushes are contacting here, as it's spinning, we're deactivating and activating different segments of our commutator and essentially turning on and off these electromagnets. All right, so this is definitely bad. Um, the magnets, must be there was a little bit of water that got in the housing. The magnet actually separated from the case. It must have just been glued in there. You can see a little bit of uh, adhesive in here. So it must have been sitting like this, water got in there, and uh, ruined it, basically. But I was able to also take this and reassemble it. And you can see inside here how those commutators go past each of the brushes. And the brushes themselves slide along the contacts. Now I do want to see if I can energize this and see if I can actually make one of those magnets moving nearby it cause this thing to turn. So let's give that a shot. What we've got is the base is now taped to the housing, kind of flipped over upside down. We can see that we've got our brushes here and here and you can see our commutator and this is allowed to spin. The brushes are connected to a power source, and that power source is 18 volts, so it's underpowering the motor. This is a 24 volt motor. It should still provide motion. Um, what it's gonna get tricky is just making sure that it kind of follows. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use 
this magnet from the housing and we're going to see if we can find the energized magnetic segment of our armature. So we're going to energize the circuit <clears throat> and it's as I bring this magnet closer back here I can't really feel it but as I get closer I can feel a vibration through the magnetic fields that are being generated. The reality is that when we talk about little uh, wall chargers, like what you see right there, they're taking AC voltage and they're converting it to DC. And that AC voltage is basically, for lack of a better expression, the AC voltage fluctuates positive and negative. So if we were to draw that, AC volts goes positive and negative. And so zero volts is here halfway in between. <clears throat> what you have is a situation where it goes 120 volts, terrible too, and this is positive. And then you have 120 volts negative. And what you have is a very quick succession where it switches polarity and you can have this positive and negative switching effect. And what you have is AC volt. It's alternating current because it alternates positive and then negative. Positive and negative. And it does that 60 times per second. That's what we call 60 hertz. Usually written with a capital H and a lowercase z. And that 60 hertz is what I'm feeling because when you take and you use a transformer, which is basically what this little wall charger is, it can only do so much to clean up this, okay? So what I'm getting and what you can actually feel with the magnet is kind of crazy because it's now been transformed from 120 volts AC into 18 volts DC. And that's basically up here. Now, perfect 18 looks like this. We have zero volts down here and all the way up here. But what we're getting, what you can feel with this unit, is a situation where this is not a clean signal. It's going 60 times per second. It is basically pulsing and you can feel it. It's a very strange, strange thing. So back to our electric motor that we're talking about here. Now that this is energized, what we have is a situation where individual segments here are being energized and create a magnetic field. And it's very faint out here. But the closer I get, the more powerful it is. And you can actually see it turn right there a little bit. It actually deactivated. I can't feel it changing in there anymore. As I bring it around though, whoops, I don't feel it vibrating anymore. So I'm not sure what happened, but you did see it move there just a second before it uh, stopped working altogether. But what actually is happening here is when we do have power supplied to each of these brush segments, segments of this become energized. And what it looks like is something like this. We have a positive and negative end to it, or I'm sorry, not a positive and negative, but a north and south pole. And it ends up creating these lines of flux that you can't really see, but we have a south and a north, or I'm sorry, not so much that. They're being created on the other side as well. And so one end becomes north, the other end becomes south. And the magnets, when they're built in north and south poles, interfere with the lines that are generated by the electromagnet that you're creating, it creates a movement and it wants to move away. Just like putting two magnets together, it wants to move this away. And we use that 
desire for this magnet to push this magnet out of the way to generate movement and torque. And that torque is what we utilize to actually open and close your door locks, operate your windows. And in our very specific circumstance here, it means turn over your engine. And uh, obviously we're talking about starter motors, not just DC electric motors, but DC electric motors is where all the magic happens. It's in the basic format. Um, electric starter motors start having a few more different details. So instead of a permanent magnet, what it has is another big coil of wire known as a field coil. And it doesn't just have two of them here and here. It has another one here and it has another here. So it has four field coils and it doesn't just have two brushes, it has four brushes. So it's essentially having twice the torque because you have twice the number of uh, fighting magnetic fields and that all works together to actually get your engine to turn over. So starter motors, a little bit more complex, a little bit more going on inside them, but if you understand that these wires without tracing them, the segments where the wires contact the commutator and then wrap around individual iron cores and generate individual electromagnets, then that's really the takeaway. This is really just, um, two, three, four, five, six, it's about six or seven individual electromagnets and depending on their position relative to this permanent magnet it's got a desire to move them when these are activated and it's an opposition force all right so in one last attempt to make this thing actually work what we're going to be doing is we're going to use our permanent magnet we've got a jump box connected to this with 12 volts and we're going to activate this just momentarily i don't want to burn anything up but we're going to get this thing to actually move towards the magnet. If we turn that again, we can make it happen. Now, right now it's pointed towards it, so it wouldn't want to actually rotate. So if we turn this 90 degrees till the two poles, this north and this south, or this south and this north line up. Actually, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it's not the happiest thing in the world, but it actually does work. That's pretty cool. Let's turn it on one last time. Uh oh, she gone. I wonder what happened there. Had juice, now we don't. I think maybe these are uh, welding themselves to the brass. Yeah, it's kind of not really the happiest. Let's try one more time. Yeah, those brushes are getting a little bit cooked. But essentially that's it. It was attracted to this and it's trying to pull towards it or trying to push away from it. Not really sure which one it is. But it, the electromagnets created here are opposing the electromagnet here, causing this to move and actually quite fast. I feel like this thing's going to come apart and get me in the face, so I'm not going to do that too many more times. But, yeah, that's an electric motor kind of exposed. So that's it. Electric motors. Pretty simple, very straightforward concepts. As long as you can wrap your head around the whole idea of those invisible lines of flux. Um, really not a whole lot of pieces. You've got a shaft that's supported by bearings in a case. You have armature windings, which make up the individual segments of the um, electric motor and um, bigger motors typically have more of them. Um, more expensive motors usually have more of them. 
and then you have the rotating contacts known as the commutator. The commutator is simply a rotary contact switch which allows the brushes to pass electricity to the moving pieces. Um, those brushes, they wear out. Brushes are designed to wear over time. Um, but they're also designed to conduct a lot of electricity and they pass the electricity from the wires that feed power into the motor's assembly to the actual rotating parts and pieces. Once you understand that you're making and breaking those contacts and when you make and break those individual contacts you're making an electromagnet, well, you, it's very plain and simple after the fact. So um, any questions and comments make sure that you email me or give me a call or ask a question on Google Classroom to clarify anything and uh, I greatly appreciate it and I'd love to answer the questions. So please, I encourage the comments. So, thank you.